Benedict or Roy Speaker. Roy Speaker, okay. This is the second one that I'll speak. That Benedict, he is the current member of the Freebirdy Coating Member. That is, every two years, everyone from the Solar Committee will choose the nine members of the project to be the leader of the project. 然后还有他同时也是那个 Free Beer Foundation 的那个董事之一。那他那个现在是在德国的 Dunster 呃科技大学当那个系统管理员，还有呃系统管理员跟城市设计师。那他要介绍那个他在那边所使用的一套 Monitor 的系统。好，那我们就把时间交给他。Okay, hello, thank you uh, for the introduction, Liwen. So, uh, this is my uh, little uh, bio, I, I guess, in my open source work. I, um, so, this, this is related to my talk because I thought I would uh, present a little bit more about um, how to use FreeBSD, what you can use it for, and it's basically my uh, part of my work. I work on the, uni the University of Applied Science in Darmstadt in Germany, a long way from home. Um, and I administer the big data cluster there. So the big data cluster is mainly used in research and uh, teaching. So um, uh, it's basically a shelf full of uh, machines and all those machines are managed by me and I have to find a way to make that easy for me. And uh, monitoring is one part of that. I'm also a FreeBSD committer since, oh wow, my 10th anniversary this year, wow. Um, yeah, I started as a documentation committer and uh, over the years I got handed more hats and people trusted me more and so um, I'm now uh, the Vice President of the FreeBSD Foundation Board of Directors uh, which is a great honor and uh, the FreeBSD Foundation, you've probably heard this before, is supporting the FreeBSD project in many ways that um, the project itself can't do legal work, advertising, map marketing, so some of these things are um, key points that the FreeBSD Foundation is covering. Um, I'm also on my second term of the FreeBSD elected core team. So FreeBSD has a, um, their leadership is elected every two years. So that's the core team, it's seven people. And every committer who has a commitment can cast their vote after uh, every two years. And uh, those with the most votes win, or the first nine people. And then after two years, they've done their work, or they can run again. Um, but it's a nice way of um, changing your, your leadership sometimes and um, bringing new people into the um, ranks of people who can make um, important decisions about who gets committed and things like that or project direction. I also do a weekly uh, podcast, uh, formerly video podcast, now it's audio only, although we re still record the video and uh, I'm doing that with Alan Jude, uh, who's known for his ZFS work uh, and uh, it's called BSD Now. If you go to bsdnow.tv, you will see the latest episode because we had to pre-record for this week because I'm not there to record. So we did pre-recordings for that, so we have one every week and it's covering BSD news, um, questions from the users and uh, it's a great way to keep up with what's the latest in the BSD world. Okay, to this talk. Um, I focused my talk because I, uh, in the last year, had to um, do a lot of things on the cluster and I thought it would be interesting to have a proper monitoring setup and that's got me into the actual world of uh, monitoring and what that means. So when we talk about monitoring generally we are um, thinking of three aspects. First of all, if you have a bunch of machines, I guess many of you have, <laughs> not just your laptops, uh, you're talking about is this machine maybe a server somewhere or a, maybe a monitoring station, a little weather server or your home NAS. You want to know, is this thing running at the moment? Is it doing its work as it should be? Um, so that's the question of availability. So we periodically uh, ping this machine, that's the most basic um, availability check. And if it's responding, then it seems to be up, at least it's responding on the network. And this is a way to check, a very simple uh, way to check whether the service is available. Uh, but that only tells you whether the machine is there or is answering. It doesn't tell you anything what the machine is currently doing. Uh, that's what metrics are for. So you um, collect, connect to the machine periodically at a certain interval and um, collect some data. What's the CPU <coughs> doing? How much memory is being used? What are uh, the disk status? Is the disk full? Is the disk empty? Or um, 
any metrics that the machine can provide. So the services that you are running, uh, is the website still up, is the web store still handling transactions and things like that. Uh, that's what I'm going to talk in this um, talk, that's why I highlighted this a little bit. And uh, logs is also an important thing. So now that you know a machine is up and you know what the machine is currently doing, but logs is also an important um, message be it, or important uh, aspect because it might be that there are, are a lot of errors written into the logs and you never see them if you don't uh, check your logs. And there are systems available, uh, I'm not talking about them now, I just want to um, complete that picture. Uh, these collect all the logs from various machines and collect um, and process them and make them uh, visually appealing so that you can find certain errors in a certain time frame. And the metrics that I'm going to talk about are um, fairly easy to collect, and that's what I'm going to show in this talk. And the nice way of, if you collect these metrics and store them, that's what I'm going to show next, um, you can see into the past what happened in the machine. Like, uh, maybe you noticed, oh, the machine is not up anymore. Okay, so when did that happen? Maybe it happened an hour ago or five days ago. Oh, if it happened five days ago, then you have different problems. Um, but let's say this uh, outage uh, appeared an hour ago and you want to know uh, five minutes before that happened, what was the machine status? Where Was there a lot of traffic on the network? Was the CPU handling a lot of work? Was memory exhausted for whatever reason? So that gives you a way to looking into the past what happened on that machine and that helps you making um, or getting an idea of where this bug was coming from. Maybe you were attacked on the network or you had a lot of CPU cycles that caused the machine to crash for whatever reason. So this might be uh, a good indicator of what happened. And uh, to build this monitoring system on FreeBSD is fairly easy. To that. So that's what I'm going to go through. And I will give the slides to Lee Wen so you can basically do this in a, in a rainy afternoon or even <laughs> on a sunny afternoon. It's fairly easy and straightforward. And so these are the components that I'm going to use. Um, First component is InfluxDB. I'm going to explain what it does. And then there's Telegraph, and there's a component called Grafana. So um, don't be scared by this uh, architectural picture. It's actually more easy than it looks. It's just that they can provide a whole bigger architecture or a whole bigger uh, picture than um, we are going to build here. So what we're going to do here is basically uh, the central component is the InfluxDB. This is the the central database that's storing all the logs that we're collecting, or all the, the metrics, they need to be stored some, somewhere, and that's the InfluxDB. And it's stored in a way that you can retrieve them relatively easy, and that other systems, like Grafana, for example, can pull the data out again, and then process them and uh, create pretty pictures <laughs> from that. Um, but the central database needs to be filled somehow. So the systems need to send their metrics to uh, the InfluxDB. InfluxDB does not do that itself. And that's what Telegraph is for, the uh, gray box on the left. Um, and this is basically running on each machine. And then Telegraph's <laughs> literally each um, individual metric into the central InfluxDB. And from InfluxDB, Grafana or another graphing solution can pull out the information and uh, present them in a visual way. And of course there are other ways, um, you can run this in a distributed manner, that's why there's so many uh, boxes behind that uh, central box, so you can connect different services to it, or you can have um, some uh, alerting, so if a certain uh, value in your measurements are over a certain threshold, maybe uh, if your CPU is over 90%, let's say, then you want to be alerted and get a email or an SMS or some other kind of message. And that's what this uh, can also do, but I'm not going to cover this here, it's just showing that you can hook into uh, many other uh, parts of this uh, system as well. Okay, so that's the architecture, and uh, here this is our components uh, again, so you can see te what Telegraph does, it sends the collected metrics to InfluxDB, so this is running on each individual machine, whether it's uh, a server or a your notebook or some weather station that you might have or your, your NAS running at home storing your files. And uh, InfluxDB is the central uh, component for that. It basically retrieves these uh, telegraph logs and stores them internally in a, in a format that's um, uh, saving some disk. And it's growing, of course, over time because there's the more uh, metrics you collect, the more you can uh, retrieve. 
And uh, Grafana is, uh, so Telegraph and InfluxDB are developed by the same company. Uh, and Grafana is basically a third part or a third solution that hooks into that and creates um, the, the dashboards for the pretty pictures that you can see. The um, uh, InfluxDB can also um, provide data to other graphing solutions. So Grafana isn't the only one. So it's very uh, flexible and open to um, hook into different systems. But I use Grafana here because it's uh, easy to set up. OK, so the first thing that you do on FreeBSD is um, you install the required packages. And of course, uh, let's say we need all three of them because you also want to monitor your monitoring server. Um, because if your monitoring server is down, then you don't know what's going on. And it doesn't collect metrics from the other machines as well. So on FreeBSD, this is fairly easy. You just do package install. And uh, on other systems, uh, on Linux, you need to add repository keys. And then you need to refresh your repository. And this is all not necessary on FreeBSD. You just do package install because, as uh, the previous presentation showed you, there are people around uh, the world that are doing these ports for you and do all the dirty work finding these ports and creating a nice infrastructure with make files that you just um, can do package install. So we, we install InfluxDB. Let's say this is our central server. You only need InfluxDB on the server where the logs are sent to. The InfluxDB doesn't need to run on all the machines that are monitored. Uh, Telegraph needs to be installed on each machine that you want to uh, monitor. And uh, Grafana, there are a couple of versions in the ports collection. So I use the latest one, Grafana 6. Uh, it has a couple more uh, features for uh, better graphics. And you can look at the uh, release notes, what those do. But basically, Grafana is um, uh, giving you some nice pictures. Uh, next, we create entries for our etcrc.conf, and that's fairly easy to do using sysrc. You just say service name underscore enable equals yes. And after you uh, issue these three commands, of, uh, as root, of course, or with sudo, uh, then you have uh, three new entries in your rc.conf, and those basically let the services start on uh, reboot, or when you say service, uh, let's say influx D uh, start, that's what we're going to do next, then it reads those entries and knows what to do. Okay, so now we have the uh, software on our, our machine, and the next thing is to actually configure it, so we look at influxdb first. So influxdb is fairly easy to configure, it just has a single um, I mean, the log config file is a lot bigger, but the important parts that we need is um, just this part, the HTTP. Uh, so there are a couple of other ways to send the data to InfluxDB. Of course, there are um, more secure ways than HTTP. There are encrypted ways, so if you don't want anyone listening on the network, um, get your uh, uh, metrics uh, over, over time and make uh, guesses about how your systems are doing, then you can have that encrypted. But I kept it simple enough so that um, you can follow it. You can always add more um, stuff to it later. So it listens on port 8086, and you can find it to a certain address. So this would be your, server, your central InfluxDB server address, and um, it's listening per default on port 8086. Uh, you can change that, but I would keep the default so you can um, make sure that it knows which ports to connect to. Uh, and that's all uh, for the InfluxDB. You can uh, start that already since we created those entries in rc.conf. You can just say service InfluxDB start. And um, now that we started that service, we can now connect to that database. It's basically um, a simple uh, version of SQL. You can see from the commands there that it's fairly close to SQL. And what we need to do in the database, so there's uh, an, a shell for it, so you can, it's like Postgres shell or your MySQL uh, environment uh, shell that you can connect to. It started with influx, you just run influx, and then it gives you a prompt in your InfluxDB database. And we need to create a special database for it, or a separate database that will hold our logs. This one is called, very creatively, Telegraph. You can call it any way, uh, any way you like, uh, but I just use Telegraph because then I know that this is the database that Telegraph is sending the data into. And now you need to uh, think about a retention policy. Uh, retention policy is basically uh, the idea that you um, want to throw away some of the older data that you're not interested in anymore. And um, that doesn't make the database grow as much as possible. So um, if you collect data every, uh, every year and are not uh, interested in the 
the data from last year, then you can just say, I just want to collect data for 52 weeks, that's this um, duration over here, and um, after that time, the oldest data is thrown away, and so this way your um, disk space doesn't grow too long. But how long you want to retain your data is, um, is your decision. You can just say, um, you, you just define the policy, give it, give it a nice name so you can remember it, and you define on which database this policy should apply, in this case on the Telegraph database. And then you can say, um, <laughs> the shortest one would probably be one day or something, um, but you want to keep a, a couple of weeks of uh, data. So I have 52 weeks here, but you can easily say I want to keep data for two years, and you would basically say uh, 104 weeks. Or you can also define it in days or in, in, in hours if you're uh, more in that. You can also uh, define a, a replication factor. That's not what I'm doing here. Replication one, it's a bit cut off on the right, sorry for that. Um, you can say, I want to replicate this database to other hosts, so in case the main InfluxDB goes down, I have still a copy, so this will uh, periodically sync the data with the other database, the standby. So, okay, now that we issued that command, uh, we can uh, run show databases, and show databases is basically confirming um, that the Telegraph database is existing that we just created, and there's an internal database as well that uh, InfluxDB uses for accounting information and some other internal statistics. Uh, we don't care about that, we just want to uh, see our Telegraph database. Of course, we need a user to connect to that database because we don't want the world to access our Influx database. Um, we have a separate user for that, and uh, we create a nice uh, password for it. The command is basically create user, your username of choice, uh, with a password that's hopefully secure enough and hard to guess. And then you say this user should be allowed on uh, our Telegraph database using grant all. You say grant all on Telegraph to the Telegraph user. And with show users, you can confirm that this user was created. And you can see that this user is not the administrative user because we don't need that. There's a separate user for that, but this user should just um, be allowed to write into the database. Okay, now that we've done that, we can exit the InfluxDB shell uh, by just typing exit or control D, and we're back in our uh, Unix shell. Okay, that's fairly easy to do. It's just um, creating the database, creating the retention policy on the database and the user. Okay, so now we can use that on the Telegraph. So Telegraph, here's the um, a definition on the website. Uh, it's basically a little agent on the on the machine that you want to monitor that periodically sends uh, information that you configured in the config file to the central InfluxDB database in this case. It's very small and simple um, uh, because if it would be a very thick and fat agent it would also consume a lot of CPU by itself and that would, um, would screw up your, your measurements um, because then it would consume I don't know, network bandwidth or CPU, uh, and that is not the, the way we want to have it because we want to sit, have it sit in the background and just collect these statistics and doesn't use much uh, processing cycles on its own. So that's why there's a men very minimal memory footprint. Okay, so the, um, don't be scared. The, the configuration file looks a bit um, bigger, but we are mostly caring about the outputs. So. Uh, Telegraph can send its data to many different uh, systems, but we want to have the InfluxDB output because we configured InfluxDB earlier. And we basically define in the URLs what's the IP address or the, the DNS name of our InfluxDB server. You remember the port 8086, that's exactly the port that the InfluxDB is listening on. And you can either have that um, Telegraph on the same host where the uh, tel InfluxDB is running, or most cases have that you have a system separate from your central InfluxDB server that is collecting the metrics and send the data to that central machine. Uh, log files are always important, so that's uh, basically uh, a given. You can change that path. Uh, this is the left path on FreeBSD that I use, um, but you can have any, any log file path that you want. And then you define um, what kind of metrics this specific instance should collect. Uh, from the machine. It can, if you have a different machine, you might want to collect different metrics there. Um, by default, Telegraph provides you with a lot of examples and a lot of uh, metrics to collect. And there are plugins where you can um, 
collect even more metrics. So um, what you always want to know is what's the CPU doing? Is it uh, spending its time in system? Is it just idle or what else? Uh, so you can um, break that down into a certain section. You can say, just give me the total CPU or collect CPU time. I don't want to see that. And you say false to that. And uh, your report active uh, also falls. You can play a little bit with those settings and see what they do. And so each of those sections uh, define a certain input that uh, the uh, Telegraph should collect and then send to InfluxDB. And you can see some of them have configure options, uh, like the CPU one. And there are other ones that just collect what they what they gather. So the inputs inputs.memory is basically just set it and um, it will collect the right way. It can define or it can find out what kind of operating system you're running. So you can run this uh, on FreeBSD and it will find because they have a different um, way that they manage memory than the Linuxes of this world or other systems that the Telegraph runs on. So you can just say inputs.memory and you will get the right metrics that you are interested in. So this is what I typically collect. So I collect some I.O. statistics, some uh, kernel information, processes, what the swap is doing, and some system uh, statistics. And uh, since I have a couple of disks connected, I, I ignore <laughs> certain file systems like DevFS. So otherwise, you get warnings like, oh, DevFS is 100% full. Yes, of course it's 100% full. It's a special file system. So you can say, I want to ignore that because you're mostly interested in your connected disks or SSDs. OK, now that we've done that, uh, oh, it should uh, read uh, starting the Telegraph service. Um, so sorry, this is a wrong slide here. Uh, this should read service Telegraph start, of course. Copy and paste error. Just saw that. Um, so you start the Telegraph server on each machine that uh, this is running, so that this ascends to InfluxDB. OK, so now the last part is the Grafana. So we have now a. Uh, telegraph, at least one, sending its data to the influx DB, and now we need to look at, want to look at that data because um, we can send it there, but it's sitting then in the database and no one looks at it. Uh, we need a graphing component that does that, and this is what Grafana is doing. Uh, first of all, we need to start Grafana. It's just another service running on your machine. Uh, this is typically the same machine where influx DB is installed, your, your monitoring instance. But it doesn't have to be. You can also say, I want to run Grafana on a different host than the InfluxDB. This is your decision how you want to structure that. <laughs> I keep it simple here. I run it all, all, all on one machine. Um, after you issue that uh, Grafana start, it needs a couple of seconds to initialize. So if you um, go to your website immediately after running that service, it might not be up yet, and you wonder what's going on. It needs a little bit of a couple of seconds to initialize. Um, don't get nervous. It will, it will work. Uh, to see if that uh, is actually uh, running, it's running by per default on port 3000. Yes, you can change that in Grafana's config file, uh, but by default it's port 3000. So after uh, you have started that service, you can go to um, InfluxDB and that's or to your Grafana machine, and that's basically the IP address of your Grafana server where you just started that service and port 3000, and then you can see pretty pictures. So this will open a website uh, where you log in. Uh, the defaults are provided on the uh, InfluxDB website, on the Grafana website. It's admin, admin, username and password. Of course, it uh, asks you immediately to change that. Um, <laughs> otherwise, this would be open to the world and everyone could guess it. So within Grafana, it's all a graphical configuration from here on. You can see that you need to um, define a data source that Grafana is using to paint these pretty pictures. And you can see there's a couple of things where Grafana can um, use as sources, MySQL, for example. But we'll use uh, the, the one in the middle, InfluxDB, because that's what we want to uh, run on. And here we define our data source. So we basically enter the information we already uh, provided. So here in InfluxDB, that's a, that's a little name and um, identifier. Then we provide the URL. The URL is basically the URL that you have for your InfluxDB database. And there are a couple of access methods. If you have a different access method than just HTTP, you need to define them here. And down here is exactly that user that we defined earlier in our uh, Telegraph user or our uh, retention policy. So we basically provide here the Telegraph username, 
the database and the password for it. I choose a different password here, so uh, you can see that it's a bit longer than just Telegraph. And then you save that, and it will automatically test whether that data source can be found from that machine. And if that's the case, then it will give you a, a success message, and then this uh, data source is created. You can create a lot of data sources, but we, in this example, we just one. And now that Grafana has a data source where it can pull data from, it can now start to create a dashboard. And there are two ways that you can use dashboards in Grafana. First, you can create your own dashboards and you can define how the x-axis should look like and what the scale should be. Um, but if you don't want to spend much time and just want to see the data, you can use uh, dashboards that other people have created for you and just um, import them into your infrastructure. And it's done in the following way. There's a little import button here. If you go to dashboards, there's the import button. And you um, can import those directly from grafana.com. They have a lot of different dashboards with different input sources where you can um, just download and look at them. And you, the only thing that you need is a Grafana dashboard ID. And that's provided on the actual dashboard on grafana.com. And once you enter that and tap into a different field, it will automatically connect to grafana.com, download that dashboard as a JSON definition file into your Grafana, and then it will uh, tell you, please tell me uh, the data source that I can use to fill this dashboard with, with data. And that's basically it. Then you have a little dashboard. So this is a little screenshot from my, uh, one of my machines in the big data cluster. And this is basically <coughs> pulling the data from InfluxDB and then presenting it in a nice way that makes it uh, more easy to inter interpret these data. So you can see how many users are logged in, what the CPUs are doing, and um, uh, disk statistics and uh, similar stuff. So this is fairly easy to do and uh, pretty straightforward since the components are well connected to each other and they have uh, open interfaces so other systems can uh, hook into that and create um, either a, a sender into uh, InfluxDB or uh, they can pull data out of InfluxDB. So it's a very open system where a lot of other open source components can uh, uh, interact with. And since this is running on FreeBSD, it's very uh, easy because the installation is easy. You don't need to um, figure out where the package sources are. You just do package install. And the configuration is also fairly easy. For example, what I have is I have some of the, the, the actual Grafana, the InfluxDB database that needs to be stored on disk, of course, and I have that as a separate uh, ZFS data set that's compressed, that's saving me uh, a bunch of uh, megabytes. Um, and it's um, over time, it's growing, of course, and the, more, uh, the longer InfluxDB is running, the more time it's uh, uh, giving me. It's, uh, the information is just in, invaluable for me because I know what's going on in my big data cluster over there. Uh, if you want, I can uh, connect to my VPN at home and we look at this, uh, the big data cluster, uh, what it's currently doing, so you can see my Grafana setup. We have a bit of time left, I think, for that. Uh, I unplugged the video for this because uh, otherwise I'll show some passwords that you're not supposed to see. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And this is all recorded, so uh, <laughs> that's that's extra fun. I had it in a tutorial once, and uh, I learned my lesson there. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, so this is my Grafana instance. It's basically uh, everything I showed you earlier. So I have a couple of uh, dashboards imported. You can try out a couple of dashboards from Grafana.com. Uh, for example, this one is the. Let's see how this works. Yeah. Um, so here they provided a couple of variables so you can select which server you want to see. So uh, we name all our uh, cluster servers uh, uh, after cities in Game of Thrones. Uh, so you can uh, pick one. Let's look at Winterfell, whether it's still good. Whoops, sorry about that. That was a bit too fast. Uh, Winterfell is down here. And whoops, this is the wrong one. I have a different entry for that one. This is that. Now it's switching to that machine. Well, it's not available, apparently. I probably need to look into that. 
Uh, I have a dashboard that's actually working. And this system. Yeah, when you download the dashboards from grafana.com, make sure that they are compatible with the input source. In this case, it's uh, InfluxDB. Ah, oh, this one is working. So you can see um, what the CPU is doing and uh, some other metrics. You can also configure these if they're not showing you any data, then either you don't have an, uh, a telegraph input source defined for that, or you need to change uh, labels because some of these have uh, Linux uh, interface labels like ETH0, and then you need to change that to the FreeBSD equivalent. Uh, you can do that by right-clicking on, on this one, and then you can say View and Configure. Then you can make changes to the panel or change the, the formatting a little bit or the colors even. And you can also say, uh, I wasn't uh, there last week, so let's say I want to see the day before yesterday, what happened in the cluster there, and I see that there's a, a bit more load than today. So you can go back in time and see what your servers were doing while you're not there looking at them. And if you're interested in some details, like let's look at this memory, uh, swap here, you can look at individual stats here, if, you, if I move around my mouse you can see the, the actual time frame. If that's not precise enough for you, then you can create this little frame here and it will automatically zoom in and you can really go into it and see what happened between 8 and, I don't know, 8.30 or so. And you can really see individual details. So each time you draw this little uh, rectangle around it, it will zoom into further that, and um, it goes into the granularity that you configured in your telegraph. Um, so if you say telegraph should send only uh, every 10 seconds the data, then you can only see intervals of 10 seconds. And now you can really go into each individual uh, minute what your uh, data uh, was, or what your server was doing and the data it was uh, collecting. But that's pretty nice, and um, you can also say, oh, I want to not see all CPUs, I just want to see CPU 1, for example, if you're interested in that, maybe one CPU was uh, making interesting things that the others didn't do. So you can really um, switch around between uh, different systems. So let's go to another one. Uh, yep, this is that machine. Let's go to our biggest machine in the cluster, which is, of course, Valeria. If you follow Game of Thrones, you know what this is. And you can see this has 56 CPUs and it has a bit more power on the under the belt, and um, I just gave a professor last week access to that machine, and I, I'm happy that this machine is still up and it's not doing any crazy things. Uh, but you, here you can really see how many CPUs you have and um, what each CPUs are doing. So some CPUs are more busy than others, uh, but I can put work on that machine so it will reuse all the CPUs in the, in the cluster. So yeah, that's pretty uh, much the presentation. I have some more uh, information here if you have any questions and here are some links to the, to the websites of the individual um, components here. You, you notice that Telegraph and InfluxDB are developed by the same company and Grafana is separate because it's a, it's a dashboard solution that can tie into other um, sources as well like databases. Well, yeah, if you have any questions then uh, yeah. Oh, uh, I guess you need the microphone so that people can hear it in the, the recording. Oh, okay. Hello, do you ever met data loss situation? Oh, you mean in uh, InfluxDB? Yeah. Um, not yet. It's um, The only data loss is uh, the time interval between the telegraph sends. So if you have a 10 second interval, of course, so um, the question was about data loss uh, in InfluxDB. So the only data loss that I've encountered is basically the time intervals between the next time Telegraph sends the next uh, data over to the InfluxDB. And so these 10 seconds, they are lost basically. Um, but I've never had any problems with the actual InfluxDB itself uh, or any, any crashes because you can always configure a replication in InfluxDB, so you can send it to a separate server and then um, use that data if the original uh, database is, is corrupt or has crashed, so you can always use the separate uh, instance. But th if you define a granularity in Telegraph, like send me uh, only every minute uh, uh, a current metric, 
then you only have a granularity of one minute. You can't go any any closer or any, any deeper, like on the like ten seconds sale. Does that answer the question? Okay. Anyone else in the back? Hey, hello. Uh, as I know, uh, InfastDB uh, 2.0 uh, has released Alpha in uh, January and uh, has released uh, Beta in May. Do you know when is the uh, GA day? InfastDB 2.0. <laughs> little exercise will you win. Um, so I know there's uh, currently uh, in the ports collection there's only Grafana 1.37 or so, but I think they're all also working on um, uh, the, uh, version number two. Um, and I think it's just a matter of time whether that's available. So I think it will be in the ports collection because it's the next version and they will update that. Yeah, I actually look forward to that because it has, it has a couple more features. So. Maybe next year there's always a, an updated talk with, with new interesting stuff in there. Anyone else? There's yeah, Ali went. Ah, walk. <laughs> Hello. Um, I want to ask. Uh, I know there's something called Prometheus. It's also a metric collecting uh, service. Uh, are there any difference between Prometheus and Telegram? <laughs> Actually, a sporting event. Um, yeah, I am. Prometheus is one other collector that can uh, collect system metrics and send it to a central source. Um, I've experimented a little bit by my with my research for what kind of monitoring solution I want to use. Um, Prometheus is also nice because it uh, can also provide a higher granularity, so it's not just 10 seconds or like you can send it every second or even smaller, yeah, well, five second intervals for example. Um, this is nice um, depending on how, how the granularity is that you want to have. Um, you can definitely, uh, I think there's a connector from, so that you can run um, Prometheus, send that to InfluxDB and Profana will pull it out as normal. Uh, it's just a matter of configuring. It's um, there are a couple of sections that are commented out in the configuration files for Telegraph and for InfluxDB. And if you want to use uh, Prometheus, I think there's a section for that. So it's just another um, monitoring and metric solution. It's nice that you can exchange individual components in, uh, in case you don't like one or the other one is not uh, doing what you want or maybe one has uh, different ways of collecting metrics that are more accurate. So it's definitely good to, to try out different solutions before uh, picking one and then uh, running with that for a while. Yeah, so that definitely look at Prometheus, it's uh, another good solution. Anyone else? Okay. So definitely monitor your system, it will give you a lot better insight what these systems are doing and where some errors are. So sometimes you have a spike every hour and you wonder what's going on and then you see, ah, of course, it's a cron job running. Or every Sunday there's some backups running and you see a lot of uh, disk activity. So, uh, or you just look, hey, what's happening at 3 a.m. in the night on, on my machines? And maybe you found that someone logged in and did something without you noticing. So definitely uh, let your system tell you what, it, what they are doing that you can make, uh, then you're a better system for that. And I have 50 seconds left. <laughs> so yeah, thank you all. Oh, yeah,